All right, so we wanted to shoot this video to discuss the discovery process and give our clients a bit of an overview of what the discovery process looks like. So first off, let's talk about what discovery is. So anytime you have a lawsuit, be it a car wreck lawsuit, breach of contract, or a divorce or a custody case, the discovery process is the exchange of information between the two sides. So take, for example, a divorce, the divorce is filed, uh, both sides have a lawyer, maybe there's some temporary orders that get put in place or are being negotiated or litigated. While that process is going and actually immediately once the lawsuit starts, there's this discovery process that begins and continues throughout the process of the lawsuit. First of all, it's important to talk about with discovery how crucial it is that information is produced to the other side that supports your lawsuit or information that's requested by the other side. So if you have something that's going to help your case that you intend on using in court, you have to produce it to the other side in response to discovery. If you don't produce it, the judge may not let it be introduced into evidence at a hearing or at a trial, and it could be critically damaging to your case. Also, if the other side asks for something from you uh, and you don't produce it, then there could be sanctions or attorney's fees ordered by the court and it will make you look bad overall in your case. So it's really important to take the discovery process seriously and work with your lawyer in doing that process and producing what you need to produce in your lawsuit. So let's talk about what discovery is sent and what discovery is required to respond to. So it used to be uh, before 2021 that there would have to be sent what's called an initial disclosure along with other discovery tools that were sent between the two sides. Since 2021, we have new rules which actually require in all cases with limited exceptions that there's this thing called initial disclosures that automatically happens in a lawsuit without there even being a request made. So when a lawsuit is filed, including a divorce or a child custody case, when the other side answers or responds to the lawsuit or their answer deadline runs, then automatically there's a thing called initial disclosures that go into effect and both sides have 30 days to respond to these initial disclosures. There's not even a request sent. The initial disclosures are governed by the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure about what, what both sides have to produce. And your responsible attorney handling your case is going to let you know what you need to produce. But generally speaking, it's financial statements, it's tax returns, it's credit reports, it's any type of text message or email or video that you think helps your case. Kind of this initial information that both sides need in, in order to pursue a divorce or a child custody case. So the attorney responsible for your case is going to work with you on coming up with those documents. So what I tell people on initial disclosures is it's always better to overproduce and really get all the discovery done through that initial disclosures. Now there's some more requests that could and probably will be sent in the lawsuit once those initial disclosures are done, but we'll talk about that in a second. So what I tell my clients is in response to the initial disclosures, let's go ahead and produce everything that we think we're going to have to produce in this lawsuit. And that's a lot of work for the clients. It's a lot of front-loaded work. Oftentimes we find that the other side doesn't take initial disclosures as seriously as we do, but it gets that hard work in a lawsuit done and it gets you ahead of the game uh, in an advantage over the other side if you've taken those disclosures seriously. So I tell my clients, go ahead and gather all the financial statements we think we're going to need, all the emails, all the text messages, all the videos you think that are going to support your case. Uh, any type of emails with the school, any type of documentary evidence. I mean, really, the, the list is, can be all-encompassing, but anything that you think is going to support your case, it's important to get to your responsible attorney right away so he or she can produce it. And again, the responsible attorney is going to work with you on that. And again, there's a set list that's required by the initial disclosures. I just think it's a better practice to go above and beyond that just to get it all out of the way, uh, and to make sure that whatever you need or whatever you think is going to support your case has been produced and you don't have this awful situation where you're sitting in a hearing and you haven't produced something, you haven't disclosed it to the other side, and you can't use it in court. So that's initial disclosures. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work right off the bat in a lawsuit. But the better job that you do on the initial disclosures, the easier the rest of the discovery process is going to be and the easier the lawsuit's going to proceed forward. So work really hard with your responsible attorney on those initial disclosures. Now, once the initial disclosures are done, there's typically other discovery requests that are sent. And those are requests for production, requests, requests for interrogatories, and sometimes, but not often, what's called requests for admissions. So let's sort of take them one by one. 
So request for production is this huge list and this huge request that gets sent by both sides asking that the other side produce documents. All my clients have the exact same reaction when they see the request for production because it can be anywhere from 50 to 100 requests uh, with all these various different items and it's overwhelming and they all have the following response. Are you serious? Do I really have to produce all this? And the short answer is no. Uh, it's not going to be as bad as it looks. Uh, I always tell clients, remember, whenever we send these requests for production, you know, both sides, frankly, and I'm not saying it should be like this, but both sides, frankly, have a form that they use. There's forms that family law practitioners use for these requests, and we ask for more than we need, knowing that we're going to get less. The reasoning for that, uh, frankly, is, you know, you'll see if you get a request for production, request number 67 asks for you to produce your driver's license or asks you to produce something like about livestock uh, or mineral rights. And you're reading it going, why, why are they asking me about mineral rights? I don't own any mineral rights or livestock. I don't understand why I'm getting this request for production for that. And I tell people, remember, it's, it's a form and it gets sent because nobody wants to be the lawyer that five years down the road gets the call from the ex-client saying, hey, we never uh, divide up the mineral rights that we had. And you go, uh oh, I forgot to ask about the mineral rights. And that's why we send these sort of really expansive requests. Um, but the reality is what folks are producing is much, much less. So when you get that request from production from the other side or you see our office send a request for production, key point number one is don't get overwhelmed. And actually, if you've done a really good job on your disclosures, most, if not all, of the requests for production is going to be repetitive because it's going to ask you stuff like bank statements, tax returns, text messages, emails, health insurance information, life insurance information. And if you've done your job with your responsible attorney for those initial disclosures, it's all going to be repetitive. And the response is going to be, see my response to initial disclosures. So again, do a really good job in that response to initial disclosures, and it'll make the response to the request for production a lot easier. Um, there may be some documents that are covered by a request for production that weren't covered by the initial disclosures, but the work will be much, much, much less. And the last thing I'll say about requests for production is remember, we didn't used to have these required initial disclosures. So to get the documents that are covered by initial disclosures now, we used to have to send requests for production for those. So a lot of what we're sending, frankly, is kind of a tool of the past, but we still send it just to cover all of our bases. But again, the theme being, if you've done a good job on those initial disclosures with your responsible attorney, it's going to make responding to that overwhelming request for production a lot easier. The next thing that people send, and it's pretty common to send, is what's called a request for interrogatories. It's essentially asking the other side to respond to some pretty form questions uh, and respond to them under oath. All this, by the way, is done within 30 days uh, that the request is sent. Uh, so you get a request for interrogatories, that you answer interrogatories, you've got 30 days to respond to them. Most of the time, those interrogatories are going to be form questions. They're questions that everybody sends in a divorce or a child custody case. For example, wh who do you want to have custody and why? What possession schedule do you want between the two households and why? Do you have any concerns about the other parent or the other parent's decision making and why? Uh, do you have any, have you noticed any changes in the child's behavior when coming from the other parent's house? And why do you think that is? Kind of this attempt to capture, broadly speaking, kind of what the other side's position is in the lawsuit. And then for a divorce, you know, what's your property? What do you claim is separate in community? What's the value? Do you have any reimbursement claims? Do you have any fraud claims? Do you have any other claims that we need to know about? These are kind of broad questions that get sent by both sides, trying to encompass and capture what the other side's position is. Point being, so there's no surprises at trial. So those questions can be overwhelming because it can be up to 25 questions under the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure, but it's really, really helpful for the case, the better the job that clients do in responding to those questions. Because if you think about it, you've probably already done most of the work for the interrogatories as part of your initial homework with our office. So when you come in, you've hired our law firm, we'll have sent you some homework to work on, trying to get the responsible attorney a timeline for your case, your position on things, uh, information about your case. So we should have most of the information already that's in your interrogatories, and hopefully you've done a lot of the hard work already. But it's really crucial that you respond to those fully, because again, think about court if your case ever goes to a hearing or goes to a trial, and you are asked something specifically in your interrogatories, and you don't 
include a particular fact or particular position in the response and then try to bring it up at trial, the other side has a valid objection that says, you know, Judge, they can't talk about that. I, I asked them about complaints they have about the other side in interrogatories, and they never listed this fact that this individual is trying to testify to, and your evidence could be excluded. That's not meant to scare anybody. That just goes to show how important it is to work with a responsible attorney and answer these questions fully. And then last, there's a tool called Request for Admissions. That tool, frankly, is rarely used uh, in a divorce or a child custody case. I'm not a personal fan of Request for Admissions, except for in very limited circumstances. But sometimes you, the other side will send what's called a Request for Admission. And all that is is just asking that you admit or deny particular facts. For example, if the other side had a piece of property that was owned before marriage, you may get a request for admission that says, admit or deny that the real estate X was purchased before the marriage. Or for a child custody case, you may get something like, admit or deny that the child has a particular diagnosis or that a particular event happened. Again, it's rare and you probably won't see a request for admission, but if you do, it's just important that you respond to those. The Texas Rules of Civil Procedure actually say if you don't respond to a request for admission, then the fact asserted is, is just deemed admitted. So it's really important to answer those and, and answer those timely. But all this is to say that the discovery process is really important. It's frankly probably the most tedious part of a lawsuit, and frankly it's probably the most difficult thing for a client to go to as far as just the logistics of gathering all this information. But it's crucial that you do a good job on it. The lawsuit gets stuck dead in the water until the discovery process is done. So I tell all my clients, I know this isn't fun to respond to. I know it's a lot of work. Let's get through it. Let's get through it now. Because the last thing you want to do is be going through a divorce or a child custody case and be stuck there for three or four months. And then when it's time to start thinking about pushing this case to mediation or a final trial, the other side goes, well, we haven't responded to discovery and we still have more work that we need to do and gives the other side an opportunity to delay things. Um, or again, worst case, you go to a hearing or a trial and you haven't taken discovery seriously and some of your evidence gets excluded. So it's a necessary part of a lawsuit. It's a very tedious part of a lawsuit, but it's really important that we take it seriously and the responsible attorney in charge of your case is gonna help you through that process.